Production support for this episode of In Focus is provided by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to central and southern Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by WTIU members. Thank you. Mitch Daniels is leaving office at the end of the year after serving eight years as Indiana's governor. He'll be remembered for many of his initiatives and accomplishments, including the leasing of the Indiana Toll Road, building Interstate 69, maintaining a tight state budget, and passing right-to-work legislation. But the impacts of many of those changes have been blasted by Democrats, who say the full brunt of the governor's tenure isn't yet known. We'll take a look at Daniels' time in office and the impact it will have on Hoosiers for years to come as we put Mitch Daniels' legacy in focus. And thanks for joining us for this edition of In Focus. I'm Stan Jastrzewski. Governor Mitch Daniels' eight years in office is being remembered as a time of big changes and sweeping reform that left the state markedly different than it was. Both supporters and opponents say Daniels was decisive and left no doubt as to who was in charge. But as Indiana Public Broadcasting's Brandon Smith reports, whether changes made under the Daniels administration were positive depends on who you talk to. Ask people around Indiana politics, whether supporters or opponents of the governor, what the highlights or lasting legacies of Mitch Daniels are, and the same items keep popping up. The Major Moves program, leasing the Indiana toll road to a private consortium, fixing the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, education reform, building I-69 from Evansville to Bloomington, privatizing parts of state government. But ask Daniels what he hopes people will remember him for, and he insists the memory of that laundry list will probably fade rather quickly. He hopes Hoosiers remember him as someone who changed the culture of Indiana government. We're a leadership state now, and uh, uh, we, do, we like that, and we want to continue to be. So I hope that we're in a higher gear and that um, uh, the citizens of Indiana like other states admiring us and emulating us. Adam Horst, who worked on the governor's first campaign driving the RV, which became Daniel's trademark, and climbed the ladder in the administration to become budget director, says Indiana had an inferiority complex. Horst says perhaps Daniel's most enduring legacy is helping reverse that by creating a culture of bettering performance in state government. Prior to Daniel's administration, Horst says there was no incentive to do better. If you think that the person sitting next to you who's not working as hard as you is going to get the same pay raise as you get, why are you incentivized to put in longer hours or work the weekends or try to do something that might be somewhat controversial um, or might be a little bit risky? Um, and now I hope that culture has changed. Daniels himself admits his legacy has not been fully decided on issues such as education reform. From the state's voucher program to the A to F school grading system and changes to teacher evaluation and licensing mechanics, Daniels says he doesn't know for sure how they'll look in five or six years. House Minority Leader Scott Pilath calls Daniels one of the fiercest political opponents he's seen. Even somebody like me would never argue that Mitch Daniels has not been um, a powerful and aggressive governor. Um, he has been. Still, Daniel says he doesn't think of himself that way. Except uh, if we think we've got a really good idea that's good for a lot of people in this state, then we, we tried not to get run off it just because um, somebody didn't want anything to change. Several people say when the full impact of many of the governor's accomplishments is felt, it may not be Daniels himself who gets the credit or the blame. Daniels is okay with that. He says his legacy isn't something he's worried about. I don't use the L word, you know, because uh, we were just trying to do something every day that we thought made good sense and let the chips fall. The impact of so much of what Daniels and his administration have done over the last eight years hasn't been felt yet by the governor's own admission. So perhaps the best and fairest way to grade the governor as he leaves office is to award him an incomplete and check back again in a few years. And we're joined in studio tonight by Murray Clark, the former Indiana GOP chairman and the man who chaired Mitch Daniels' 2004 gubernatorial campaign. Also, Les Lankowski, who served with Daniels in the Reagan administration and succeeded him as president of the Hudson Institute. And Jerry Wright, the chair of Indiana University's political science department. Thanks to those of you who are here tonight and those of you watching at home. Let me, let me ask Jerry you first. Uh, mm. How long, generally speaking, do you think, when we're talking about someone's political legacy, how long does it take to determine that? I think it's often almost impossible to determine because so many other events will intervene and national politics will come and go. 
if you look back at most governors, unless they've had an extraordinary program that sort of set that pattern for other states, um, the legacy's kind of forgotten. Their supporters thought they were great. Their detractors thought they weren't. Uh, and it's really hard to trace it. I mean, even as we saw in the video, it's going to be hard down the road to decide whether or not things like major moves really worked or not. Uh, Seventy years from now, when the, when the chips are finally in, they may look back and think, oh, that was pretty smart, or, or not. It, it, it's very, very hard. It's a lot like presidential mandates. It's a lot in the eye of the beholder. I wanted to ask each of you. Oh, but just I should. I'm not the chair of the political science department. <laughs> <laughs> Thank golly. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask each of you to get started. Uh, and, and, and Murray, we'll start with you and we'll go down the line. Give me, just as, as a frame of reference in, in each of your minds, one of the biggest successes of Mitch Daniels' time as governor and one of the areas where, call it a failure, call it a place that the, the state could have done better, uh, something that needs improvement. So a success and, and a needs improvement that, that you think have come out of the last sure. eight years. Well, I, you know, I think that the underlying kind of motivation of the governor was really about putting the state on a better financial footing. As you recall, in 2004, the state was running a pretty strong deficit, very strong deficit. And now we've gone from that point in time to a strong surplus, which is important uh, for somebody like him. And, and I would argue all Hoosiers. I also think that he did try to change the way state government uh, works. And, uh, you know, I, and I think he has to, in, in many ways. The governor, I think, was, was really focused on what state government should do and should do well. That's, that's roads, that's state police, that's child protection. Uh, and I think his lasting legacy, and, and Jerry makes an excellent point about how you, how you look at a, a legacy of a governor, because so, you know, we live in such a dynamic world and political environment. But the one thing I think you can say now is where he went from 2004 to 2012 in terms of the financial footing of the state, the solvency of the state, I think you can see that pretty cl clearly right now. I think the governor, if, if he was sitting here right now, would say maybe the one thing he regrets not being able to accomplish uh, in the way he wanted and was outspoken about was reformation of, of local government. Um, we, I think the legislature stuck its collective toe in the water on that issue, but didn't get anywhere near what he would have liked to have seen and what the uh, Kernan Shepherd um, Commission uh, with uh, Joe Kernan and Randy Shepard led a commission and the bold changes that they had recommended with respect to municipal government, which by and large really have not occurred. Less a positive and a negative? Yes, I think um, on the positive side, the um, much like Ronald Reagan in 1980, uh, Mitch Daniels came to office as a champion of uh, smaller, leaner government. And yet as he's leaving office, one of the things he's done is restore a lot of confidence in the ability of, in this case, state government and President Reagan's case, the federal government, to actually do important things. And I think that's going to be uh, a legacy we already see and um, we're going to see more of in the future for both uh, good and ill. The, uh, confidence in government will lead some of his successors to try uh, things that maybe they should not have been trying. Uh, more substantively, I think uh, the most important uh, set of changes he made is, uh, will be in education reform. We don't really know how these are going to go play out over, over uh, and we will only find out over the next few years, but Indiana has clearly moved from being one of the laggards in school reform to one of the nation's leaders, and that was always a weakness, including a weakness in our ability to attract uh, business here who uh, were reluctant to come given the quality of the workforce. On the negative side, I certainly agree with Murray Clark that uh, inability to reform local government is one. We've also had to stop at a new start on welfare reform and more broadly dealing uh, with uh, the needs of low-income people. Uh, after a, 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 the contract with IBM didn't work out, a new vendor has been chosen, things are looking better, uh, but uh, there was time lost uh, and of course this came at a time of growing need in the population. Mer or, uh, uh, Jerry, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, when I first got into political scientists, one of the 
earlier in this book, so I read on state politics, it was written, something written by uh, Larry Sabatov. It was a book about governors, back the only book about governors we had then, called Goodbye to Good Time Charlie. And it was, it was a set of stories about the incompetence of state government, and particularly the governors that were running. And he was arguing then in the 19, late 60s, going into the 70s and 80s, that a new breed of governor was coming about. I think uh, that were competent, they were more CEO-minded than just getting by and collecting patronage and, and jobs. And I think Governor Daniels is the epitome of that. Uh, we interviewed, my wife and I have a textbook, and we interviewed him uh, in 2005. And I was strongly impressed in an era of really highly ideological politics that he really didn't care much about that. He was a problem solver. And the reason he said he had no interest in going into the legislature was that so much about position taking, and he really wanted to get his hooks into solving uh, particular kinds of problems. I think he set out an agenda for these, and it's really an impressive record about how much he has gotten passed and how much has been accomplished. You can just go down, and they, in the video, they ticked a number of the major moves, bureaucratic reform, he's, uh, the solvency for the state government is in better shape, uh, daylight savings time, the economic development, the health care initiative, a number of these. It's really an impressive list. I'm not sure it's a negative side, but for at least certain, certainly the Democrats in the state it would be, is that his policies on the whole have moved things distinctly to the right. Uh, if you look at his property tax reform, it, on the one hand, it solves the problem of the volatility and inequality across the state in assessments and the property tax, but the way of making up for uh, the shortfalls was a regressive sales tax, an increase in the state sales tax, and then forcing local government to rely more on the sales tax rather than the property tax. It was a shift from those who have more, property owners, uh, to those who have less, those who have to spend a large portion of their income. Um, on, on retail goods for which property tax is charged. And so, uh, and we see the same thing, Indiana led the way in voter registration. It's a program which Republicans have consistently liked, the Democrats don't, they think there's a strong partisan bias to it. It's on the face argued to stop voter fraud, for which there's very little evidence, but it's highly, it's highly political. And if it has an impact, and that research on that is, is iffy so far, it's gonna be that it hurts Democrats and probably at the margin helps Republicans some. And so, and you can go down, I think uh, a number of the programs uh, that he's passed, and it, it's, an, it's a nudge, a distinct nudge uh, of Indiana to the right. But I think maybe the one program uh, that he passed, which affects all Hoosiers, and they're never going to, and it may be his legacy, is daylight savings time. <laughs> I, I, I went, moved from California, and, and would have to call my mom. She says, now what time is it there? She always had <laughs> trouble figuring that, and everybody knows what time we are now. So I guess uh, that may be the one thing we do remember for sure. Uh, Les, you mentioned education, and this was something that Governor Daniels mentioned to us himself, and he says, look, there is some thinking still to be done about what the state's education reforms are going to mean, especially since the superintendent of public instruction, who was backed by Governor Daniels, got thrown out of office, basically. Uh, the, the public voted overwhelmingly for, for Glenda Ritz last month, and now there's question about what she's going to be able to accomplish because she's facing up against a, a even more heavily Republican legislature as more Republican legislators were voted in at the same time she was voted in. Um, so there's this interesting dichotomy about what it would seem people want and people would think about education in the state. As, as it relates to the governor, this is a guy who at the bottom of the recession took $300 million out of K-12 education, much to the dismay of Democrats in the state legislature. Um, this is a guy who champions school vouchers, w which are controversial all over the country. How do you think it's going to come down, and what will happen, if anything, to change the way Governor Daniels is looked at during Glenda Ritz's time and beyond? Well, I think um, you've put your finger on a very important point, which is that in order to get these reforms, Governor Daniels had to overcome a lot of political opposition, including within his own party. Part of the reason that uh, Superintendent Bennett lost was not only because of the mobilization of teachers' unions against him, but because people within the Republican Party weren't so sure that uh, they liked all these reforms. I think the critical one is ones are going to have to do with evaluation, accountability, core standards. Uh, whether or not uh, schools all around Indiana uh, will be insisting that students take a curriculum rich in academic content, that teachers have the ability to teach that well, and that schools as institutions are held to account according to whether or not children really learn. Um, 
we have to get outside the uh, idea, which um, uh, certainly figured in that legislative debate, that we measure the quality of schools by how much we spend on them. Uh, I know Governor Daniels didn't think that way. That was behind some of his effort. Obviously, money matters, not saying it doesn't, but what matters more is what the money buys. And I think that will be, um, that's the central part of Governor Daniels' efforts, and that's what will, and, and whether schools buy uh, what uh, kids really need to learn will determine the outcome. Murray, I wanted to ask you about major moves. Um, this is something that uh, just about as soon as the governor took office, he said, look, we're going to find a way to get some money into the state, and we're going to find a way to address some of these road projects that have been sitting dormant for 20, 30 years in some cases, and now we're starting to see that as you've got an interstate highway now between Evansville and Crane that is the, probably the biggest part of that, that that is tangible as of right now. Um, even Democrats in the legislature who I speak to have softened on their criticism of, of leasing the toll road. They no longer even call it selling the toll road, which is what they called it initially, which was never true. Uh, now they all refer to it as the lease. And there was an interesting paper actually that came out this week from a professor at William & Mary who says the lease wasn't such a bad idea, but maybe we shouldn't have used all of the major moves money strictly on plowing it back into our roads. Maybe we should have spread it out into a number of other places. I wonder what you think the, the governor's legacy is going to be a, when it comes to how we get around this state and how, you know, whether we were seen as, you know, forward looking in terms of, look, we need a connector between Evansville and Indy. It's the one corridor that we don't yet have. Or whether as the federal government pours more money into high-speed rail and things mm -hmm. like that, it is possible we were seen as not forward-looking enough because, as the survey, the study from William & Mary says, well, maybe you should have spent it on other stuff. Well, I, you know, I, I think his legacy probably in the short term will be a strong one. Uh, money was poured into roadways that were in dire need of repair and, and uh, addressing deferred maintenance and the like. And, you know, the, when you look at... Uh, different corridors, uh, you know, State Road 24 up north and so forth. I mean, this is meaningful to communities that they, they can see. They see those orange barrels and they see the work being done. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me say, though, and this, I guess I would combine several issues here. In my view, Mitch Daniels was uh, a, really an extraordinary leader in this sense. He was able to, to be aggressive and bold on several fronts, uh, and survived to tell about it. Now, I, I would argue that it's because he was uh, pretty skilled politically. I mean, he, he, you know, he's what political director in the Reagan White House and, and so forth. So he understands politics. But major moves was very different, difficult politically, particularly in the northern part of the state when it happened. Daylight savings time. I left the the Republican Party in 2010, and, and local county Republican dinners. They still talked about it. Uh, and then education reform, which is b by definition controversial. And, and he was able to survive all of that. And that's what kind of skilled, I would argue, leader, thinker, and, and politician he was. Versus Tony Bennett, we talked about Tony Bennett. Tony uh, was not a skilled, is not a skilled politician. He'd be the first one to admit. And as he uh, invoked or effectu helped effectuate some of these school reforms, he did so in a way that I think he would argue, and many of us argue, probably wasn't very politically astute, um, but he wasn't concerned with politics. And in the end, I think it I'd bit him. But I think that could have been the same thing for Mitch Daniels had he not been such a skilled leader, thinker, and politician. No, I, I take a little slightly different tack on that, particularly with, with major moves. Uh, and it reminds me a lot of what uh, President Obama failed to do with the Affordable Care Act. He never sold it. Yeah. Uh, and we saw this thing coming down, and I remember trying to explain it to my students and trying to explain the logic, but the governor never consistently sold the people on Indiana why this was a good idea. And he took a beating in the polls. Other things recovered. I don't think it was major moves that got him back on that one. Uh, they recovered. I don't think he did as good a job of bringing the public along with him on that issue uh, as he might have. I mean, he's fine now, and, and his approval ratings are high, and his re-election was, right. was a healthy well, one. But he took, I, I think, he could have been more in touch. That's a fair thought, and I actually think the governor learned from that because mm -hmm. uh, they actually spent some time marketing kind of other issues, yeah. uh, you know, that he had. So 
Uh, yeah, I think that's a that's a fair criticism. Of course, it was somewhat more parochial because the the toll road folks up there felt like it was their road. They had paid for it. And well, let me ask a question about the political legacy here, because one of the things that has always seemed to me that Mitch Daniels did particularly well was understand how to gain and spend political capital. This is a guy who in the beginning of both of his terms does unpopular stuff, understanding that if you can get it done in the first year or 18 months, you've got three, two and a half to three years to gain it back such that you can do exactly what he did, defeat Jill Long Thompson in a landslide reelection in a year when President Obama won the state of Indiana, and it was as though that had never happened. What does his time in office mean for Mike Pence and for everybody who comes after him in terms of how you collect and spend political capital in Indiana? And, and as you point out, you know, how people such as Tony Bennett, who perhaps are not as skilled politically, what can they learn from this? Les, Les we'll start with you on this. What do you think people who come after Mitch Daniels can learn about how to govern in Indiana and how to get their ideas across to the people such that they are A, effective, and B, well-liked enough to stay in office? Well, I think the key thing is what I like to call principled pragmatism. One has to be pragmatic. One has to be practical. One has to invite one's political opponents in. One has to be willing to make compromises and to admit mistakes, which I think is an underappreciated uh, part of Governor Daniels' record. When, he, when things didn't go quite the way he'd hoped they would, he'd admit it and start trying to correct it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, being pragmatic doesn't mean going with any wind that happens to be blowing through the State House that day. Uh, it also meant for Governor Daniels that you're pragmatic within a set of bedrock principles. Among the most important were the importance of uh, finding out what works, holding people accountable, being innovative, uh, trying new ideas, uh, generally coming down in favor of smaller, more efficient government, a better business climate, fewer taxes on individual enterprise. Um, and sticking to those principles while at the same time being pragmatic about them. I think uh, especially in today's era, as we see in Washington all the time, uh, there's a lot of talk that our politics have become too ideological, not practical enough. Uh, that misses the point. Governor Daniels' legacy will be that you can be both pragmatic, practical, and principled as well and be successful. Jerry, let me ask you about mm -hmm. something that's going on here. The, as, as the governor's term in office went along, the, the Democrats lost control of the Indiana House um, and have continued to build up you know, bigger and bigger minorities in both the House and the Senate as time has gone along. And now you've got the supermajority in both houses. But I wonder if Governor Daniel's tenure, as Les, I think, alluded to, is a lesson in what I think a lot of people are talking about now, which is don't overreach if you have unchecked power. Because one of the things Governor Daniels did that I think honked off a lot of Republicans, uh, he said, let's hold off on right to work for a mm -hmm. session. He said, let's call a truce on social issues. That got a lot of Republicans nationwide mad at him. Is there a lesson in knowing how to deal with your own constituency, the people closest to you, and telling them, call off the dogs every once in a while, even if you can do everything you want to do. I, I, I really think that there is, and I think that, that, that Daniels uh, saw that actually in the, when, his, when he was giving advice to the presidential campaign is to back off on the social issues, uh, which, which did make him mad. And I think he, there's a, an executive sort of personality and a legislative personality, and they're really different. And the, the executive personality, and I think Daniels very much had that, is looks at what am I going to get done? How I'm going to be held accountable as a governor for what happens in the state. Now he's conservative to be sure, but it's the results and what he's actually going to accomplish. And I think this is one of the things I'm going to be watching in the next years is that Pence is a legislator. Legislators get their rewards for taking a position. Not for what even gets passed in the legislature, much less what the impact of that legislation is down the line. And so that's really a shift. And so some legislators that, that become governors have a hard time making that transition. And they think, this is my position, and even if I can get a coalition, they're not thinking how that's going to pay politically down the road. And with that very strong Republican majority and Pence's traditional cam, uh, campaign positions, he's in a position to really pass a lot of very conservative legislation, but I think it's going to be that, that 
ideological point is well to the right of even the average uh, conservative Hoosier. And if he's not careful, he's going to actually get and generate uh, a, uh, a possibility of a backlash if he's not really sensitive to how people are going to react to the outcomes of decisions versus what his very strong base is saying we want. Uh, Murray, let me get a quick thought on that from you, too. You were in the legislature for a decade or so. What, what is your opinion on how he has dealt with both yeah. his opponents and with the people closest we, to him? You know, as I, as I listened to Les and Jerry, their, their last comments, uh, both were spot on. And, and, when you, when you th and Jerry actually mentioned in his initial comments about, uh, you know, Mitch, your interview where it appeared mm -hmm. to you that, that Mitch Daniels was not a legislator. I mean, there, there is no question about that. He has no interest in being a legislator, whether it's at the federal or state level. He's an executive, uh, and and when you listen to uh, and that that is a big difference. I mean, when you're in the executive branch, and it could be a Bloomington mayor for that matter. I mean, you're dealing your constituency worries about the roads, the trash getting picked up, the the snow getting plowed, and it, there's kind of you don't have the luxury of being particularly ideological. I, I would submit to you, and he under. He understood that, and the other, the other thing I would say to, uh, to to all to to Les's comment. I mean, when he described kind of what drives uh, Mitch Daniels from a, a philosophical standpoint, I mean, it's Reagan. I mean that. I mean that. that and and, and uh, knowing Mitch as, as I do, I mean, he has such extraordinary admiration for the way Ronald Reagan led, and and Reagan began very ideological. I mean, there was a point in time, but he was the executive in California and he understood how to deal with the public and with his own people. Now today, in today's environment, it might be more difficult with a more seemingly polarized uh, political world. Um, Les, I'm going to give you the last word. You got about, we got about 45 seconds. That's plenty. We, one other name we haven't mentioned yet, which goes along with Reagan, is Dick Lugar. Mitch Daniels came to politics as a protege of uh, the outgoing Senator Luger, another good example of a principled pragmatist. Plenty of people criticized Dick Luger when he was mayor of Indianapolis for being too conservative, but of course he too behaved as an executive, made important changes, and I think Mitch Daniels learned those lessons well. In the future, people will talk about Mitch Daniels the way we've been talking about Ronald Reagan and Dick Luger. All right. Well, that's probably a good place to leave it. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. I know this is something that's going to be discussed, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad we were able to sort of get out in front of this discussion a little bit here today, and thanks for uh, helping us out with that. Please do send us your questions for our next In Focus program. The email address to do that is infocus at indiana.edu. You can leave a comment or see the full video of this show by visiting our website, indianapublicmedia.org slash infocus. Thanks to you for watching and listening, and have a nice night. Production support for this episode of In Focus is provided by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to central and southern Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.